Welcome to Lore Party, the podcast that explores the stories, characters, and universes of our favorite video games. I'm Connor. And I'm Lawrence. And today, we're it's a special episode because we are tackling the first of the brand new HBO uh, Last of Us series, which was fucking good. I'm just going to get that out of the door right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's let's yeah. Spoiler alert: We liked it. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, it's a big day. Uh, the premiere episode, the first episode of the Last of Us series on HBO, uh, premiered this past Sunday, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna break it all down. Everything that happened in this episode, everything we thought about it, and yeah. Long story short, we were both very happy with it. But we'll get we'll get specific. Uh, here I feel in a like I I feel like this is what Star Wars fans were waiting for before the Mando dropped. Yeah, that's. I, I feel like we probably feel similarly uh, right now as maybe our good friends Jaden and Kevin felt after Andor wrapped their first season. Because I, I was hearing a lot of the same things. Like Andor was, you know, the reaction to that was, "This is the Star Wars content we've been waiting for." And you know, I think you and I are in the in in the boat of this was exactly what we were hoping for. This this kind of adaptation was uh, dead on on the money. So uh, yeah, we'll get into our specific reactions and takeaways. Uh, but first, a little bit of housekeeping, as always. We love to hear from our listeners, always. Uh, we, we can't get enough of uh, viewer uh, listener feedback, so please don't be shy about emailing us at podcast at loreparty.com with all of your stray thoughts, your questions, comments, uh, and you know, who knows? Your email could make it into a future episode. It might read it out loud. You never know. Hell yeah. And uh, if you want to get in touch with us directly, you can find Lawrence uh, at Produced by underscore LK on Twitter and Twitch. All day, every day. And you can find Connor on Twitter at Connor Howard VO. And you can check out his website at ConnorHowardVO.com for all your sweet right. voice acting needs and lore party related. Hire me. Yeah, hire, hire him. <laughs> check out Hot Takes. Uh, listen to this episode. I will act for you and Lawrence will make music for you. We're a, we're a deadly combination yes. here traveling duo of uh of creatives <laughs> also um, that's uh connor with an er very important to remember remember that's yes ER. very it's very important <laughs> add that er um but you know you can also connect with the rest of the team on instagram twitter and twitch at lore underscore party and similarly remember that underscore because i don't know what else you'll get if you type it without it could be weird yeah lore no space no underscore party you, that could take you anywhere like you don't could bring you to the crypto bros <laughs> well, like I said, we'll uh, we'll get into uh, you know all of our thoughts on the first episode. It's a uh, it's a mushroom zombie nightmare that we're going to dive into uh, head first. But before uh, we get started with that, we're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. But don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. And we are back. So. You know, obvious spoiler warning, if you haven't watched the first episode of The Last of Us on HBO, uh, now is a good time to pause and go watch so uh, you avoid spoilers. But if you are caught up, if you've watched the first episode like us, stay tuned. Uh, we're going to break it all down. Also, if you haven't played the damn so. video game, it came out in 2013 <laughs> on PlayStation 3. You literally have no excuse. Go play the video game. Watch the first episode. At least play the first part of the video game. Watch the episode. Yeah, play the first couple hours. Yeah. Uh, if you are that rare individual who uh, didn't play the game and are just watching the show, uh, I think I mentioned this uh, in our trailer reaction episode, but please contact us. I want to know. I so badly want to know your impressions on this show because Florence and I are both coming at it from the perspective of fans of the game. So, like, if you're just watching this on TV and you haven't played it, like, I want to get inside of your head because well, I'm I, curious. I so know cool of a person. Fan. Uh, shout out to Lucy from uh, On the Path podcast uh, with Brett. Mm, okay, uh, the, uh, she's the co-host down there. Yeah, she has. Uh, Lucy's a huge gamer, but she doesn't have a PlayStation and has never played The Last of Us and is waiting for it to come out on PC. Wow. And so she is. They're going to cover this on their podcast also, and uh, she has yet to play this game. So like, she doesn't know <laughs> anything that's happening. And I was like, what the wow. fuck? I, I like really want to experience wow. that from like. From her perspective, that yeah, absolutely. That's that's fascinating. Lucy, hit us up. We'd love to hear from you. We should have her on sometime. Yeah. Have them on sometime. That'd be that'd definitely. Be great. Um, but yeah, now that we've officially warned you, let's 
get into the recap of this episode. Lawrence, you want to kick us off? So we open up on a panel of scientists discussing world-ending threats on a television program in the 60s, one of which was the guy from The Mummy, and I just focused on that way too hard. John Hanna. Shout out yeah. to, a, to a legend, yeah. Just just showing up for <laughs> for this like fake pseudoscience and Love scaring him. the shit out of everybody. But it's like one one researcher theorizes that, you know, a uh, fun guy can carry the greatest potential like to end human civilization as we know it. This guy's yeah. Mushrooms, they're not as good as you guys think. <laughs> <laughs> so, mushrooms you know, somebody, are not your friends as it turns out. <laughs> right. All you people out there with your mushrooms, think again. Uh, you know, some of these, you know, some of the fun guy he suggests already um, like he are already like parasites that feed upon insects and could do the same thing to humans, assuming that like someday they evolve to survive the uh, body temperature um, of humans, like the whatever body temperature it was. I can't remember. Um, uh, but the scientists. Oh, wait, yeah. Yes, that that <laughs> is the, that is the body temperature. <laughs> Fun fact for all of us that aren't cold and dead on the inside. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but you know, the scientist posits that if the world were to grow slightly warmer, these <laughs> imagine that. <laughs> all right, these you know, fun guy could adapt and become capable of controlling human hosts. A scenario that obviously troubles him. You know, good thing global warming didn't happen. <sighs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. If only there were. <laughs> I sure hope there isn't a flash forward to the, uh, you know, the two thousands where uh, that might be the case. <laughs> no, it's it's like obviously the scientist played by John Hanna. Uh, you know, he's you know theorizing all this and like he's you know it's a serious threat to him. Uh, but if you look like there was a cool you know camera angle like you know a shoot uh, a shot around the room where the audience is like sitting there and everyone in the audience looks obviously troubled as well. Like oh shit, he's uh He's spitting right now, and that's like Hell it's yeah. uh, concerning what he's talking about. So that's only a couple degrees. <laughs> I'd be like, oh shit. Uh oh. <laughs> yeah. So uh, as a matter of fact, there is a flash forward to not really the present day, but uh, you know the the bygone year of two thousand three that you know <laughs> some of us lived through. <laughs> <laughs> George Bush's America. George Bush's America <laughs> is where we uh, pick back up in this uh, episode, and uh, a teenage girl named Sarah is uh, at her home uh, in Austin, Texas, and, you know, seemingly lives by her, uh, alone with her with her dad, uh, a guy by the name of Joel. She wakes him up and makes breakfast for him. Uh, it's It turns out that it's actually Joel's birthday, but he's been too distracted to remember how to, to buy a birthday cake or, you know, like make plans for his birthday. He's just been running ragged. Um, and he apparently works with his brother, Tommy, his brother, Tommy comes over, Tommy and Joel work together. Uh, I'm guessing as contractors, like construction workers, they, they build, uh, you know, houses and stuff and they're about to go to a job site. And so everyone's getting ready to go to work or go to school. And, uh, as Sarah's eating breakfast, uh, everyone's talking about, you know, these, some stuff they're hearing about on the news. Apparently there's been some unrest in the rest of the world, uh, across the globe in, uh, Indonesia, there's apparently rioting and, you know, just violence and stuff going crazy. And, you know, it's one of those things like, yeah, it's in the headlines, but it doesn't really impact our, our daily life, you know, foreshadowing. It, it, <laughs> it was like it was like a uh, like gut punch, a global warming followed up by like right before COVID. Like it was the it was the combo. That's right. Yeah. Well, Druckmann hit us with a two piece. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so. Before she leaves to go to the school, Sarah sneaks into her dad's room, uh, opens up, uh, you know, some drawers, and she uh, takes a, a wristwatch as well as some cash. And it's like, oh, shit, is she just stealing from her dad? That's weird. Why is she doing that? I, another little detail that might not might come up again later, might not, but she also uh, picks up a, a knife, like a folding blade, kind of hunting knife almost looking thing, and uh, admires it for a while. So just, you know, that might come up. That might, you know, be a factor again later. We'll see. Uh, but she takes the watch and like, you know, a few, a few bucks on their way out, they are greeted by their neighbors, an elderly couple. Well, an elderly guy, uh, named Danny Adler, who's out front and he seems to be feeding an elderly woman, possibly his wife or maybe his wife's, uh, possibly his mom or his wife's mom. And, uh, he invites Sarah over to hang out with, uh, his wife, Connie and, uh, uh, Joel kind of all volunteers her for it. Like, oh yeah, she'd love to come over. So it's one of those things like, it seems like, you know, Sarah spends time over there. 
you know, as, as a single father, Joel's working hard all the time. So Sarah's probably, you know, over there a lot so that, you know, she's not alone in the house. And, um, this, 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 this scene actually, I think was, was, was cool to, uh, get across that, you know, kind of like we saw in the game, Joel's a single father. He's working hard. He's struggling to provide for, for his teenage daughter, Sarah, trying to give her the best life that he can. But I think, um, the show actually goes a little further. It shows us a bit more of how Sarah had to kind of grow up fast and sort of help take care of her dad in return. It's like, yep. She's almost parentified a little bit in, in this yeah. sense. So, um, interesting scene. Uh, interesting. So yeah, we're introduced to this whole family, family unit, you know, dad, daughter, uncle, uh, and how they kind of interact with each other. And so, um, they, uh, head off to start their day. Yes. And I won't go into it now, but this like scene just made me realize like how much I've played this video game. Cause like, I was just like, <laughs> wait a minute, the neighbors have a different name of the game, but I won't that's go right. Mm-hmm. But after <laughs> I'm like such a fucking nerd at that point, <laughs> Wait a minute. Um, actually, yeah. that's like, different. Wait a minute. You're not the right person here. But, <laughs> but uh, after you know, after school, Sarah goes to a tinkerer shop to get the watch fixed. Uh, outside, you see ambulances rushing back and forth. Um, you know, down the street, flying around. It's kind of crazy outside. And soon after, the shopkeeper's wife enters in a hurry and closes the shop. And then, you know. Poor customer service tells Sarah that she's got to go home, even though they're like smack dab in the middle of a transaction. Luckily, right. luckily that the, uh, you know, the tinkerer is like really good at his job <laughs> and just did what he had to do in two seconds for the 20 bucks to fix the watch. Um, and then uh, Sarah goes on her way. But it's kind of kind of interesting because like we see, you know, we're going through Sarah's we're going through Sarah's day. And, um, you know, we won't talk about this like now I'll go into it a little bit later, but it it's like we're getting to see the beginning of the end, which is yeah. not something that was conveyed in this way in the games. And it was like super interesting, like that COVID thing that I'm talking about. It's like, remember when it was just like all overseas and it's like we're like ah, that right. fucking sucks right. for everybody over there, but it's like it's still such a it, it seems like such a distant thing for us at that time. Yeah, and like that's kind of what it feels like here. The tension was slowly starting to build up in this part of the episode where like yeah, the crisis that started off far away is starting it's slowly coming home now, and you're seeing yeah. it on the streets outside. And I I, I love this moment of the the tinker's wife kind of just rushing like you know she knows that something bad's about to you know really break out and go off and she's you know it uh, you know for us like if we saw this happening yeah it's like oh what are you that's a that's weird why are you closing the store but like the way she talked to Sarah like the fear in her voice and on her face was like I'm doing you a favor you should go home right now like I'm like you know I don't want to talk about it right now but. I, I've 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 been hearing things and I'm scared and you should be too. Basically, that was a cool scene, and like it was weird because it like hit it hit home for me because like right before things closed for COVID, I was mm-hmm. out because I was getting a suit for a friend's wedding, mm-hmm. and it was like we all were in the shop together, and they were like, "Hey, just so you know, we have to do this fast because all the show all the shops in the area are mandated to close now wow. in like the next like couple of hours." <laughs> So it was just like, you know, there was like, Ooh, we don't know what's happening. And it was so uncertain. There it was like, you know, we all got to s- kind of separate from each other. So like that fear, it felt like felt real there. Like, it's yeah. like, hey, I don't know what's about to happen. But all I know is like, we need to take care of our own. And like, this mm-hmm. business isn't isn't worth our time right now. Right. It's 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 relatable for sure. And, and done in a believable way on the show. Um and that leads us to, uh, you know, Sarah goes home. She takes she takes the lady's advice and goes back home, but goes next door to the Adler's house where she's kind of hanging out, passing the time, doing homework, and she's baking cookies with uh, Connie Adler and, you know, just having a good time. And she also, uh, you know, gets up to look at the movies on the shelf in the, in the Adler's house uh, while uh, the elderly lady, uh, Nana Adler, uh, just kind of sits quietly in her wheelchair in the back of the living room and unseen by sarah <laughs> this was such a fucking amazing uh camera angle sarah is just checking out the movies on the shelf and right behind her the camera's looking behind her nana adler starts 
convulsing and twitching erratically (laughs) in a very creepy way. Like this is a woman who can't walk and now she's like, you know, she seems catatonic basically uh, earlier in yeah. the episode and now she's you know j- jerking around it's like what the fuck's going on there the, I, I will i mentioned this off you know off recording but I'm on, i'll say it now my wife tried to watch this show with me and this was the exact scene she gave up <laughs> she was like all right well i'm done here i can't yeah she, like that's that was the line for hers the creepy old lady uh twitching erratically in the background so that was her tap out <laughs> but uh, that yeah that got me i was like uh-huh. Ooh, even yeah i mean even the dog was like <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah the, the dog yeah the adlers have a dog and he's just he's also just staring at you know nana like there's something not right about this lady <laughs> like yeah that, that dog was like did y'all see that shit <laughs> I, I love that that is a trope i really enjoy though the dogs in horror movies knowing something is up before the before the people do that's always a cool thing to watch um but yeah so but uh, sarah doesn't notice this she just kind of like you know you know, ignores or doesn't doesn't notice it and goes next door uh, to go home, go home to wait for Joel to come back from work. So that's kind of where it leaves us there. And so Joel does return later than mm-hmm. he promised. And he also forgot to get himself a birthday cake like every other laser focused, hardworking person out Slipped there. Slipped his mind. Yep. But Sarah uh, surprises him uh, with the fixed watch and one of her. Um, you know, his favorite like trash movies that she <laughs> borrowed air quotes from the Adlers. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, she falls asleep on the couch as they watch it together. Uh, Joel gets then gets this phone call uh, from Tommy. And it's like, you know, it's a simple phone call. Tommy mm-hmm. is in jail. But he, when he explains him why he's in jail, it's you could tell shit's about to pop off because yeah. He's like, you know, someone just kind of went berserk and, you know, I was trying to step in yeah. and, you know, now I'm in jail. Yeah. But, you know, at the time, no one knows what's going on. So Joel's just like, ah, oh, you drunk idiot. So, <laughs> right. uh, like, you know, annoyed, he's like, you know, nonetheless, he tucks Sarah into bed and just goes to leave at, or goes to bail out his brother. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it, it does have this tone that, like, oh, Joel's gotten his younger brother Tommy out of similar situations before. So it's like, oh, here we go again. God damn it. But yeah. uh yeah, so that leaves Sarah alone in the house for the rest of the night basically. And she eventually wakes up later that night. It's it's almost like dead it's a midnight, you know, two AM kind of witching hour when she wakes up and there are sirens outside. Uh, she's hearing loud noises and also she's concerned to find the house empty. Her dad's gone. So she you know looks around the house, turns on the TV and sees on the TV, on the news, there's reports of just rioting and just absolute bedlam breaking out in the city that they live near, Austin, Texas. And uh, she's like, okay, well, shit, I, I better. So she goes next door to check on the Adlers, her neighbors. Uh, yeah, this scene, yeah, so the tension is starting to really pop off here. It's like going from tense to horrific. And so she <laughs> slowly creeps into the Adlers' home. Uh, oh, shit. Yeah, and goes into their kitchen only to find her neighbor, Danny Adler, the husband, mortally wounded, like, you know, bleeding from what seems to be maybe a bite mark on his neck. And then she looks over and Nana is like, has her mouth on Connie's face, like eating her or something, biting her. And Nana looks up and these crazy little tendrils are growing out of Nana's mouth. Uh, And of course, like any reasonable person would, Sarah screams and runs away and (laughs) flees out to the street outside. Uh, Nana's chasing her. And luckily, she like, right, she like flings her body too, yeah. which is like, <laughs> yeah, dude. Oh my God. The movements that this old lady who is infected, uh, it's, it's otherworldly. It, it is really cool. Like that we could talk about this for a second. It's just the way infected people move. It's like, that's not a person anymore. That's like fungi animating like a puppet made out of flesh yeah. basically it's crazy oh it, it's puppety as hell it's yeah. it's it's absolutely wild it's fucking horrible <laughs> yeah it's yeah it so, is it is so mad i would run so fast i would do what sarah does here just run to the street and luckily joel arrives right on time uh he drives up in his truck tommy's with him and tommy's uh armed with a hunting rifle and joel's carrying a, a pipe wrench and you know, you can tell they've they've just gotten out of some sticky situations themselves. They've they've seen some shit already too. They know what's going on as soon as they see Nana, and uh, Joel, you know, does what he has to do. He clobbers Nana to death with the pipe wrench, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Sarah is justifiably freaked the fuck out. Like, what is happening? 
and you know, no time to explain. Classic, you know, get in the truck, we got to go. Uh, and so they drive away as more infected people show up and start just invading the neighborhood pretty much. Oh um, one last God. thing, one last detail I really liked about this scene that I'll mention is just how, as they're about to leave, Joel's other neighbor from across the street, her name's Denise, I think, runs out to the street and he's like, Joel, what's going on? What's happening? And she, and he just, no time to discuss, like no context to it, just yells, get inside, lock your doors. Like trying, trying to help his neighbor, trying to help Denise, like get inside, lock yourself inside. And so they drive off in the truck and they run <laughs> over infected people on their way out. <laughs> they just like the ran the them in the truck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Oh yeah. Connie comes out. Connie's infected now and comes out. Yeah. And, and, and the husband. Like, yeah. They're both are. Oh you my know. God. Yeah. They, and so he runs people over and Denise is like, what the hell, Joel? Why'd you run those people over? She runs over to help the people not knowing they're infected and they get back up and they attack her and she becomes a victim uh, very quickly. And it's, that, that's crazy. Let's like, it's, I just love how that illustrates like the border between the life, you know, the world, you know, like normal life is crossing over into a crisis situation where, you know, it's, you got to look out for yourself. Like, let's be honest. And yeah. she, uh, has these neighborly instincts. I'm going to help this person who just got run over by my crazy neighbor. And, uh, no, now they're eating me. So it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's a uh, fucking, cra- yeah, shit's popping off right now oh, for sure. Yeah. God, God damn it. Yeah. There's, there's <laughs> nothing you could have done in that situation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a whole lot of nope. but you for know, sure. as, but like as a uh, Joel and Tommy work out a plan to escape like the Austin city limits, um, and find like somewhere safe. Mm-hmm. They, they, you know, they drive past, um, a burning house, like a farm belonging to their friend, mm-hmm. uh, Jimmy, Jimmy, the Cooper's farm, the Cooper, which yeah. <laughs> just, if you've, if you've watched the last of us episode with Leo and I and the million and a half Jimmy Cooper <laughs> jokes that we fucking make, it's just like, I was like, oh yeah, they kept it. They kept this in there because the neighbor was originally Jimmy Cooper. And that was mm. like the first person Joel killed in the game. That's so right. like nice little callback. Um, and just leading up to this great, like callback to the game. Mm. Like if you haven't played the game and you go to play it, you'll see a lot of what you saw in this scene when they're, you know, driving into the city, trying to find a way like this is like shot for for, shot for shot, the burning farm, the inside of the car, Mm -hmm. uh, looking at like cops speeding down the street, people being left like that is all straight out of the damn video game. They might as well have just like took the footage and put it there. Pretty much. Yeah. I will say though the the burning barn on on a live action stage like just kind of in this format was awe inspiring just the visual of it as they drove past like it was it's not just like some smoke and you know you can see flames through the windows this thing is total conflagration like it's a fireball with how with a house built around it it's it's it was such a stunning image to see on TV oh yeah just awesome. for me at least. It, it was like absolute it was absolutely awesome yeah. And so, like, this was the fan service, like, hardcore. This is the this was the fan service scene. Yeah. And, you know, um, then, like, at, you know, at this point, you know, Sarah is in the car asking questions because, like, you know, she just saw her dad m- murder an old woman who was eating somebody with a pipe or, right. the, or the monkey wrench. And so I'm like, yeah. that, that has to be crazy. So, you know, Sarah learns that, like, the infection started in the city uh, and... And she begins to worry that, like, she might be infected because she was just in the city, um, you know, and they were, you know, the, the maybe the Adlers were in the city, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but they drive past, as we mentioned, you know, they drive past a broken down car. Um, a guy is, like, trying to flag them down. He's, and, uh, you know, Tommy is like, you know, hey, they've got kids. Joel's just like, mm. No, so do we're we. not gonna Keep pick. Going. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, "Hey, man, after the shit we saw, I'm not helping anybody." I was like, "You never know. This is like yeah. too, there's just too much on the line." Um, right. You know. So yeah, Joel. Joel tells uh, demands that Tommy keeps driving despite Sarah's pleas, and you know, he tells him that someone else is gonna come along, which mm-hmm. you know he doesn't give a fuck about, which no one yeah. would in this situation. <laughs> right. Yeah. Joel's already just you know getting into survival instincts like no nah, nope, not us like you know keep going and they they do they do keep driving until like they're you know joel and tommy are kind of like discussing like oh what's the best way to get away from the city basically and they're talking about like oh take 
you know, they, they know the place like they know the area like the back of their hands. So they're, you know, they're, they're comparing options for highways to take. And so they go toward the highway, but there's a military blockade along the road, like just all these army national guard vehicles blocking the way. So like, okay, well, how about over here? And then there's another freeway. that's completely gridlocked. Like everyone had the same idea. And so they're, they're, they're running out of options. And so they eventually just cut through grass fields and they kind of go into the suburbs, like the city limits. And they're just going wherever they possibly can to get away. And, you know, the whole time it's kind of like, it's in the back of everyone's heads, but Sarah actually vocalizes it. She says, what if there is nowhere else safe? What if this is happening everywhere? And eventually it turns out that they just kind of get penned in by just swarms, masses, massive crowds of panicking civilians are running through the streets and they can't, it, it becomes not an option to drive anymore. And especially when a, a fucking passenger jet, like a 747 is flying overhead and comes down, just, it, just plummets right into the street behind them. And so fireball, you know, just knocks out the street. Their car gets crashed, like turned over onto its t- onto the onto its onto its roof, and uh, Sarah ends up en- injuring her ankle. Like uh, she can't walk, so Joel carries her. Uh, he and Joel, or he and Tommy, try to get through the streets, but they get separated by another burning wreck of a vehicle, and so it comes down. Like just everything's happening so fast, like it, the situation gets away from them so quickly. And yes. as a viewer of the show, you're like. I was on the edge of my seat the entire time, and that is exa- that is exactly what happened when I played the game for the first time. So, like, one-to-one, same feeling of, what the fuck's going to happen? I can't believe yeah. this. Yeah, it's crazy. The adrenaline is pumping, and it comes down to Joel carrying Sarah through the streets. They run into a group of infected, and one of them starts chasing him. So Joel's running, like, running for his life and for Sarah's life. He's running as fast as he can, and this infected guy is almost on top of him when they get, you know, out onto the field outside the city and a a soldier from the nearby uh, blockade manages to kill the the infected and save Joel and Sarah. Unfortunately, uh, this (laughs) reprieve does not last. No, it doesn't. God, this was, this was, yeah, (sighs) here we go. And so the, the soldier radios his superiors for orders and uh, continues to aim his, his rifle at uh, Joel and Sarah. You know, Joel is basically just like pleading with the man, telling him that he's not sick. Um, like over and over, the soldier is, continues to get orders that we don't hear. Um, mm-hmm. But we know what they are, um, you know. And yeah. so he points his gun at uh, Sarah and Joel and then opens fire. Um, wounding them both like Joel tries to turn around really quickly. They both, you know, they both tumble down. Um, then he basically just kind of like overtakes Joel and is going to shoot him. But before he can finish him off, uh, the sho- the soldier gets shot in the head and killed by Tommy, who just kind of gets there at the perfect time to save Joel. Right. Um, and then sadly, here comes the worst scene that yeah. people who played this game knew was going to happen, and yep. people who didn't are probably like, "The fuck." Yeah, if you if you watch the show without playing the game, you're probably shell shocked by this part. Absolutely, it, it's a gut punch. And us who have played the game are still just still. Like, yeah. It still sucks. <laughs> it's not just as good. bad. Knowing it's like, coming doesn't really help. It's still just bad. Yeah, it it yeah. fucking sucks. And so, like you know, sadly, then we notice that. Sarah's hit in vital area and is bleeding out badly. Yeah. Like Joel, uh, like really attempts to like do like some field medic training um, and just like apply pressure to the wound um, and move his daughter to safety. Um, But it's the wound is too severe and like, you know, the pain is too much and like he's just yelling for for Tommy. But like just the look on Tommy's face. Tommy knows as much as it, as much as it hurts him too, he is the one that is like being more realistic now. And he just knows it's too late for her. Um, and that she's going to die. Yeah. And, um, you know, he's just staring there in horror as Joel is just screaming and sobbing. And yeah, and it's the worst scene ever it, like it just hits you right in the gut and it's, it's terrible <clears throat> it's a father holding his young daughter in his arms as she just fades away 
and it just slips out of his fingers. And, uh, you know, the, you, you know, being in Tommy's shoes, being the uncle, like you're watching that happen too. So yeah. it's like these two men, this, this girl, they both love dearly, you know, just they, they can't, they can do nothing. It's, it's helpless horror. And, uh, yeah, I think the last, like before the camera cuts to black is like this shot of Joel, just like in utter despair, holding his dying little girl in his hand in his arms. And yeah, like we've, we've said it before, we'll say it again, like watching that happen in the game absolutely crushed, crushes you. And, uh, watching it in the adaptation is just as bad. Um, yeah. it's, it's very impactful. One more thing before we move on is, uh, you know, this, this whole scene with the soldier and the the orders that we don't hear, but we kind of, you know, it's implied what they are and we, we get the context of it. In the game, I found it interesting how in the game that soldier, he we get a line from him. He says out loud, sir, there's a little girl. Like yeah. he's trying, he's like trying to reason with his with his commander, like, please don't make me shoot these people. There's a there's a young girl here. Like, please let me bring them in. And but the orders are what they are, which we can assume is no one gets in. Like no one gets out of the city. Like we're killing any person who leaves the city because we all can i guess the military considers austin texas completely lost so at that point it's containment not rescuing civilians but containing people so uh but in the show we only really hear him say yes sir yes sir like over and over and over again um it's it's subtle though it's subtle that we kind of hear this yes sir like acknowledging of the orders but he sounds kind of defeated about it like deadpan like he doesn't like it but he's going to do it so it's it's an interesting it's an interesting dynamic with this with this soldier and what he does and but no it, long story short like at the end of the day this is kind of the end of Joel's life as he knows it and that's the end of that chapter in his life before we cut to the future a very bleak yeah. future oh yeah. <laughs> yeah god damn so 20 years later 20 years is a long time a lot can happen in 20 years and uh you know as we see we you know the camera kind of comes back on a child, a young, a young kid kind of just wandering through, you know, tall grass wilderness, and then eventually comes up upon the bombed out ruins of the city of Boston, Massachusetts. And, uh, just, you see like craters and just level buildings, like nothing taller than a lamppost, just like completely laid out city, city, uh, ruins. And, uh, at the edge of the urban sprawl that's been bombed out and burned is, is this massive wall uh, like a square fortress, basically, and it's uh, we uh, understand that this is the Boston quarantine zone. It's yep. fortified by cameras, bunkers, armed soldiers from uh, Fedra. Fedra is uh, kind of the uh, the fictional agency that's basically our FEMA. You know, it stands for Federal Disaster Response Agency, and that's what's in charge of Boston here. We kind of can gain all that by the context clues that we see. And the, the kid approaches the gate and the soldiers like see him. And, oh, shit, bring him in. So he's kind of being processed by Fedra soldiers. They ask him if he has a name, uh, if he's alone. He doesn't answer, but he does nod when asked if he's alone. Um, and this soldier who's interviewing him notices scratches on him. Like, I think maybe bites. It's either scratches or bites or maybe both. But injuries that are, you know, that warrant uh, investigation. And so another soldier kind of scans the kid with this with this device and we don't see the results, but I think, I think I remember seeing a red light. You remember? Yeah, it, was it, red. it, it, yeah, it lights up red. Same. Yeah. Yeah. And so the soldier sees the result, kind of shakes his head, I think. And the other soldier, the one who's facing the kid, gets this resigned expression on her face. Uh, but she doesn't like give away too much. But she does say, you know, you're safe. You're going to be okay here. But we just have to give you some medicine first. And they inject this kid with a needle. And that's all we see. It's, uh, it's grim. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's scary in such a subtle way. Uh, it, it, this was such a well done scene to, uh, kind of bring us down to a very brutal reality of what happens and what, where we are this 20 years, 20 years after the outbreak. Yeah. Uh, and so we go to inside the QZ where like working crews are, just chucking bodies into a burn pit. <laughs> just, yeah, just, just pushing them down in there with sticks too. It's it's bad. And then um, yeah, tons of them, just one after another. Just pulling them off of a truck, and like yeah. um, one woman sees the child's corpse, the and in the back of the truck, and just kind of turns away in disgust and isn't you know like 
able to carry out her task, which is like, you know, I can't, I can't toss anybody into a fire, let alone a child. <laughs> uh, but, you know, working next to her is an older, more like just like worn out, weary Joel. And mm. uh, who just picks up the child, doesn't say anything and uh, chucks mm. him into the fire. So, yeah, it's been yep. a good 20 years for Joel. And we see it's like what, a, but it, but when you think of it, like it's it's you know like I can make I can make light of the situation and joke about it, but when you think about it, you go from Joel experiencing the worst moment of his life to like it's the death of his daughter, his child daughter, to twenty years later, this man effortlessly chucks a child into a fight in like a, a burning pit like it was a dead child but mm-hmm. like he just no with no remorse because it was his job and like that like just shows just another tuesday to him yeah yeah that just shows like how broken up this this you know this world has made him and those events have made him like you know this is this is yeah. him now so yeah. um you know after joel chucks his kid into the fire he just the, his shift is done you know yabba dabba do <laughs> and he goes, <laughs> you slide down the back of the brontosaurus and at home, and, he, yeah. and then he just goes and collects his ration cards from a federal soldier and then asks for more work. Mm-hmm. Like, OK. Um, and then, you know, it was like either some patrol duty or sewer work. And it was like, which one pays more? And it was like, which one do you think? <laughs> <laughs> the one with the shit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's like so like, you know, later we. um then, then we started to see like, you know, hey, fe- maybe Federer doesn't have our best interests in mind because later we witnessed a public hanging yeah. of civilians, you know, who broke the uh, broke the rules of federal's martial law. So yeah. like, yeah, you know, we go like a lot of death, a lot of just commonplace mm-hmm. death, too, because like people are watching a public hanging. Yeah. And I know it's like in the middle, you know, like society has essentially collapsed. But this is like 20 years later and it's like. Public execution time. We're still doing this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, 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 it seems to be a normal occurrence. Like, and the, the rules that they, they read off, like they're saying that these people are being executed for unlawfully leaving the quarantine zone or trying to leave or trying to enter unlawfully. So, like, it's, uh, it's basically a prison then, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. 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 You, you work all day. Mm-hmm. Uh, you keep your head down and you don't break the rules. Otherwise, like, Death is the thing that awaits you. They just just kill you. Yeah. And so we see Joel meet with his Federal soldier named Lee, and he trades him a bag of pills for another stack of ration cards. So Joel is also a drug dealer now. Sweet. You know, gotta gotta double up those ration cards. He's out here, he's out here pushing. (laughs) Yeah. So that paper. (laughs) Yeah, I gotta get that paper and then twenty years later. Still stacking the paper cash. that lets me eat. <laughs> <laughs> stacking rations. Uh, so Joel Joel asks him about um, a truck that he had previously arranged to buy from Lee for like the the apocalypse price of six hundred dollar or six hundred tickets. We'll say. Sure. Yeah. I think it was like I'd say oh, yeah. We'll, we'll go Something with like six hundred tickets, which I guess that's that's probably a lot of tickets. Or it's probably a lot of rations. That's like a Thanksgiving so, yeah. feast. That's <laughs> <laughs> that's probably worth a, you know three or four Thanksgivings. <laughs> <Something> <laughs> like <that. laughs> but but like they you know they they um you know he gives them the pills. They talk about Atlanta a little bit, where all they make are bullets and pills, mm-hmm. and um you know they part. They make plans to finish their deal, and uh, Lee gives Joel a warning, like the fireflies, you know, military insurgents group that have been fighting Federa in order to win people their freedom, mm-hmm. and has been very active lately, and the soldiers are getting jumpy. So it would be in his best interest to stay off the streets. Right. A little friendly advice, like, hey, uh, it's getting dangerous, you know, stay home at night. Uh, so, so Lee and Joel obviously have, you know, worked c- together before. So it's like, you know, it's just kind of a, Hey, you know, if, if, uh, word to the wise, I'd be careful because it's kind of like my, uh, buddies here and the, and the guards, like the, the other soldiers, uh, they'll shoot anyone who even maybe looks like they could be a firefly. So, you know, keep your head down. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, shit's, uh, you know, y- 
even in a place like the quarantine zone, you're not entirely safe. Uh, things are things are getting tense. Meanwhile, while this is happening, uh, Joel's friend and uh, smuggling partner, a woman named Tess, uh, they they seemingly like work together, is being held and uh, you know talked to sternly by an, a, lo- a local criminal named Robert and his cronies. Uh, we learned that Tess had previously worked out a deal with Robert to buy a truck battery. But Robert went ahead and sold it to someone else and uh, kind of screwing Tess out of the deal. As a result, you know, Robert's worried. Oh, uh, Tess, uh, are you uh, mad about that? Are you going to try and get payback on me? And she's trying to basically intimidate her into forgetting about it, dropping the matter. And like, hey, we're, you know, you're going to get over this. And she's not in a position to argue. So she's like, no, of course. Yeah, we're cool. <laughs> and I think <laughs> you and I, as you know, players of the game, like we, we know like, oh, she's, she's, blo- she, you know, she's telling him what she, what, you know, he wants to hear right now, but uh, she's trying to like, you know, smooth things over. Like it's water under the bridge, dude, don't worry about it. But as this conversation's happening, a bomb goes off outside and <laughs> blows the wall, like blows down the room that they're in basically. And, you know, it, it's like Tess almost dies in this explosion. Uh, and escapes onto the street where this is a really cool scene too, where she's just kind of like on the street and is in the middle of uh, an insurgent, like an ambush, basically a firefight where uh, fireflies uh, are, you know, on the rooftops, throwing Molotovs and shooting sniper rifles and stuff. And uh, I'll talk about this later, but you hear one of them yell free Boston now motherfuckers as he shoots at the Fedra soldiers. And there are just, you know, squads of, of soldiers like what marching down the street with riot shields and Tess is caught in between all of it. Uh, she yep. wisely <laughs> surrenders and is taken into custody by the guards to uh, hopefully escape the uh, situation she's in. Oh yeah. And I love how when Robert is interrogating and he's like trying to be intimidating, he's like also like very afraid of Joel and it's like, that guy's yeah. not going to come back. <laughs> That's like, a good point. Yeah. He's like, I got to intimidate you because like, I don't need Joel coming because right. apparently that's that's bad. I mean, we did just see him like just incinerate a child, so <laughs> I'd be kind of afraid of him too. Yeah, we we yeah we do uh, learn that to have a beef with Tess means you have a beef with beef with Joel, which nobody wants, including Robert. Yeah, nope. yeah. It's funny, <laughs> yeah. Robert's trying to be a tough guy, but like we can tell how like insecure and uh, you know scared he is of both of of Tess and Joel together. So yeah. Bit of a bit of a Weasley guy, this Robert. Make ration cards, not war with Joel, because uh, you, yeah, <laughs> you, know, you don't want that. Um, and then Absolutely. just like uh, um, you know, we see this this teenage girl uh, in a room. She's giving her name. Her she's telling everybody her name is Veronica. Um, she's yeah, she just basically she's in this room handcuffed to like a radiator or something, just like against her will. A woman enters and asks the girl several questions, testing motor skills and her cognitive functions. Um, she basically just tells her to count to 10 slowly. And uh, yeah, you know, that's it doesn't doesn't go well. She starts counting real fast, gets told to slow down, then starts counting slow, gets to eight. And it's basically just you get a, a fuck you, um, yeah. <laughs> which I'm imagining uh, they're they're trying to just confirm the girl isn't infected and right something like she's it, it feels like she's done this a bunch of times because yeah. it's just it just seemed she seems super frustrated by by all of these questions yeah just how many times are you gonna come in and ask me the same bullshit like we both know i'm not infected leave me alone like that's the that's the vibe we're getting from this uh this teenager and uh that then we cut back to uh to joel he is walking into a one of the apartment buildings, one of the slums basically in the uh, quarantine zone. And he checks in with this uh, radio operator guy who seems to be like, he, this guy seems to make a living just pat, like, you know, sending and receiving messages for people on the radio. And Joel asks him, uh, have you heard back from Tommy yet? And apparently, yeah, we, we learned that this guy has been managing communication between, between Joel and Tommy, but we find out Tommy hasn't been heard from in several weeks. Like the, yes. we haven't gotten a response from him in a while. And Joel is getting increasingly worried. Like he's he's never missed this many check ins, and so uh, this is we learned this is kind of what the motivating factor was for Joel and Tess to gather the truck, the truck battery, all these supplies. They're trying to like get what they need together to go on a voyage to go look for Tommy, basically. So yes. that's 
that's kind of a uh, Joel's call to action right now. Is like I I I got to go make sure my brother's okay. Is it bad? Like the fate. My favorite part about that whole scene was the fact that they traded that guy just like a whole thing of like Lucy's. They just gave him a bunch. Of- <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> just yeah. Joel just bunch. walks in and just gives him a little pack of homemade cigarettes. Like, hey, here's your money. <laughs> like, yeah. Tell me about my brother. Yeah. <laughs> It's like oh, just man. give him some pre rolls. You're like, here you go, man. Let's. Uh, <laughs> I know you know why I'm here, and <laughs> here we let's let's do this thing. I was like, what it the is hell? it is comforting to know that like just homegrown tobacco that someone probably cultivated on their windowsill somewhere and rolled up in like whatever paper they came across. Like that's still gonna be an economic con- commodity when you know money collapses and there's no more currency anymore <laughs> just... <laughs> so this we're telling you to invest all your money in cigarettes now if you, cigarettes. Prepare for the, <laughs> yeah, if you want to prepare for the apocalypse buy a whole fuck ton of cigarettes because like that shit is gold it'll You're only be, appreciate <laughs> you'll be selling it for supplies and you'll thank us later that's true <laughs> so uh you know meanwhile after this like we we cut to the fireflies um and we see that they're planning uh, further attacks on federal positions as, um, you know, commanded by their leader, Marlene. Uh, her subordinate, Kim, starts to question her mm-hmm. orders. And um, basically, Marlene is just over and over, just follow, follow, follow the fucking orders. Mm-hmm. And then once everybody gets out of the room, uh, she confides in Kim that, um, you know, the attacks are meant to distract the Federal troops from their real goal. They're gathering all the fireflies in Boston and escaping the quarantine zone and ta- taking that captive girl, Veronica, that we saw out west for an unknown but apparently crucial purpose. Mm-hmm. Veronica must be special. Mm-hmm. Who knows? So Marlene hands Kim a written message uh, which shocks Kim uh, you know, who asks, you know, is this real? And Marlene is like, yes, it is. She nods. Mm-hmm. The so there must be something special. We all who play the no play the video game know what's going on here. That's but right. I know some of y'all were probably surprised by this. This was cool foreshadowing, though. This is cool. It, it's it's an interesting lead up to, uh, hey, like the, the plan has to succeed. Nothing else matters. But like we can abandon Boston. That's fine. Like the, that fight doesn't matter. But that girl in that other room, that's the real that's that's what really that's what's really important. Also, it's Boston. You could abandon that any day. <laughs> Who needs Boston? <laughs> they can have it. Who cares? With your donkeys, no one wants to be here. <laughs> With your go go back to your lobster rolls or whatever. I don't know. And so we we then go back to uh, you know a dusty, cluttered apartment where Joel lives in the quarantine zone, and and we see Joel just kind of sleeping off the day. You know he's he's been spending his time you know examining maps and drinking whiskey or whatever, and just kind of obsessing over his plan to go find Tommy, and, and especially after. Pills. <laughs> oh yeah, the pills. Yeah, yeah the, those uh, Atlanta legit Atlanta hydros that he got his hands on. Uh, <laughs> So like he's had a hell of a day. He's he, he's burned some bodies. He watched a hanging, and you know he's like worried about his brother. And obviously, we we know that he's dealing with twenty years plus of horrifying, traumatizing memories too. So, you know, he's just kind of getting some rest. Hopefully, or trying to get some rest. And then Tess comes home too. They, they apparently live together. She kind of crawls into bed and lays down next to him. And you know, I'll just I'll point this out really really quick too. In the game. Uh, Joel and Tess seem to be just like friends, partners. They just you know trust each other. But it seemed like their their relationship was very platonic in the game. Like it might have been more, but it was more implied than anything. It wasn't explicitly more than friends. But in the show, they're sharing a bed, and she's like putting a hand on him, and they seem to have some intimacy that would suggest they're more than just friends. Maybe, but it's one of those things like, it, and, you know, you could read into it, uh, but whatever. But I, I think I think that's really to communicate they trust each other very very deeply, very impl- very implicitly. They're really each other's only friends, really, only real friends, only real close friends. So, um, you know, they 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 wake up in the morning, they talk over breakfast, and Joel finally notices that Tess has been roughed up a bit. She's got like a swollen eye and some scars, and he's like, "What the hell happened?" He immediately he almost jumps out of his chair, like, "Who did this to you?" And uh, he's like, ready for a fight, basically. And Tess kind of explains, like, "Oh, it was Robert's guys. They jumped me. Don't worry about it. It's fine." But she kind of explains, "Oh." We're being screwed on the battery deal. Robert's screwing us. Uh, and they make plans to go 
find this bastard and <laughs> get their payback on him by either getting their ration cards back from him, getting their battery from him, or both. So they make this plan to go and uh, take care of business because J- Tess and Joel are, you know, they, they're known in the Boston QZ as reliable smugglers, but also you don't want to fuck with them. You don't want to, like, get on their bad side. They have a reputation to uphold, obviously, so they're going to go and uh, uphold it <laughs> with Robert. Yep. And Joel is, yeah, he's got, he's, you know, he's awake from his, uh, alcohol and pill bender. So now it's <laughs> he's ready to go. Yeah. To feel the thunder. <laughs> 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 so That's right. uh, we go back to the fireflies, you know, and Marlene goes to visit Veronica again mm-hmm. and, uh, reveals that she knows the girl's real name, which is, you know, spoiler alert, not really. It's Ellie, mm-hmm. you know, we knew this is, this is going to happen. Um, you know, right. she also reveals that she was the one who arranged for Ellie to be sent to the Federal Military Preparation Schools and as an infant. Um, you know, it's mm-hmm. also revealed that Ellie escaped from the school and got herself into a bind before ending up in Firefly custody. Um, Marlene also mentions this person named uh, Riley, um, which kind mm-hmm. of sets Ellie on edge. Right. She won't go into now, but. Riley is an important character. Yeah. Um, that'll you know, that'll she, come up later for sure. Yes, yeah. you know as she as she you know um, you know Ellie's on edge. You know, like she's she's clearly like not free to go. Mm-hmm. Ellie demands to know um, what Marlene wants with her. Uh, to which Marlene replies that Ellie has a purpose greater than any of us could imagine. Another Firefly informs Marlene that he has arrived who's he hmm interesting so we uh go back to uh joel and tess they're kind of like you know they're kind of like out on the town gathering information they're finding out where robert is and they check with their sources and they find out where he is and so they they're heading there they're heading over to robert's hideout they go through service tunnels and crawl spaces and they, they know how to get around they know all the back ways into like basically everywhere in the in the qz they eventually emerge out into a building which they assume is robert's hideout they're like okay well let's they have like they have guns on them they're about to like you know go into a go into a fight they think but what they what they find when they come out into robert's hideout is they actually just find Robert's dead body, the dead bodies of several of his men, as well as uh, multiple dead fireflies. Like something went down here. It's like they look around like this was a bloody shootout. What the fuck happened here? And before they can really get answers. Oh, they also find the battery that Robert uh, (laughs) went back on their deal with him. And uh, also it turns out that it was a dead, faulty, rusted, bullshit, (laughs) really crappy battery anyway. So it was kind of like. Man, this guy was full of shit from the get-go. Uh, so, yeah, maybe a, a deal gone bad, apparently. So Ellie, Kim, and a badly wounded Marlene emerge uh, and explain that Robert tried to pawn off the truck battery to the Firefly, who weren't happy with the condition of the merchandise, to say the least. And that's what led to a deadly gunfight between all of them. And they're, they're all that's left, basically. So Marlene has a bullet in her abdomen. She's not in good condition. She's desperate. She's short on options. And she knows, like I said, that Joel and Tess are the best in the business. If you want to get something somewhere like under the radar, they're the folks to do it. So Marlene ha- like, you know, has no other option. She asks Joel and Tess to take Ellie into the city to rendezvous with another group of fireflies so that Ellie can be taken West in return. The Fireflies will give them all the supplies and even transportation that they would need to go and find Tommy. So it's like, we'll we'll make you whole. We'll give you what you need to do this thing you want to do. We just need, need to do this job for us. And so Joel and Tess kind of like huddle really quick. Like, uh, do you believe her? And, that, you know, they're kind of looking at her like a, she's in no position to like, you know, screw us on this. So uh, they kind of trust that she's good for what she's promised and they agree to do the job. Yeah. And, and like they have like you they have a history because obviously like like we you know we also find out that like tommy has a connection to marlene through that's the, right yeah. through the fireflies at that point too so right it's like you know because like part of me i'm like i just go to these guys in the first place because she's like joel uh and i like i do mm-hmm. like that the connection kind of you know pop you know presents itself in this part because like kim is like super duper like no 
I need to do this. Like, I need to do that. And like, yeah. meanwhile, Marlene is just like, shut up. You got your ear shot off. Like, she literally got her <laughs> ear shot off. And right. it's like, you it's just like, you're not, you're not that guy. Like, <laughs> right. like, calm down. Just right. come with me. And so, yeah, they, they, you know, it's like, okay, we have common interests. So like, let's not kill each other. Because mm-hmm. everybody, this had to be some miraculous ass gunfight that we missed. Because like yeah, everyone really. is fucking dead. I kind of wish we could have seen it. That would have yeah. been fun to watch. Yeah, like I was like, Jesus! I thought somebody <laughs> like I thought Federer was there. And it was just like two different groups had yeah. a gunfight in an abandoned building, mm-hmm. and now Federer is probably on its on the way because like you know it's loud as shit. Right. And um, yeah, so they agree to do this, and. Um, you know, and they they and you know, it's in, they're they're more the the deal makes sense because of that that connection between Marlene and Tommy and Tommy to yeah. Joel and everybody. That's a good point. Yeah, Joel and Marlene obviously know each other, um, and Joel has a shaky relationship with the Fireflies, particularly their leader Marlene. Because yeah, I think he mentions like, "Oh, you're the ones who turned Tommy against me. You're the ones who turned my brother yeah. against me." So we we get a hint of maybe uh, the brothers had a falling out because of the Fireflies. So. Uh, that's that's a good point, but uh, and so it's like an uneasy arrangement that they make right here, but they they make it nonetheless. So it's better than working with Robert. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> and Absolutely. so you know, like that night, uh, that night Joel and Tess they sneak Ellie out of the QZ, um, going through some of their old smuggling tunnels, and mm-hmm. um, you know it was like it's funny they take her back to the house and. And she is just annoying as hell, which is typical <laughs> Ellie. And yep. she's like, basically, before they leave, she just tricks Joel into deciphering his smuggler code, which is like right. 60s, 70s, and 80s music each mean a different thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but particularly 80s music means danger. Mm-hmm. And that is which the information she gets out of him because she waits till he sleeps and she basically just plays a song and, and, yeah. or, and or says a song played and he freaks out but right. it's, it's, he, she finds out that so that was a message from uh i think earlier in the episode tess and bill uh tess and joel had mentioned people named bill and frank yeah like uh friends of theirs that they were going to see before they left the city and in joel's kind of radio journal he he's he, uh, he wrote down b slash f and I think, yeah, Ellie sort of manipulates him into confirming that Bill and Frank had given him a radio message, meaning danger, something's wrong. So yeah. she's she's very clever to an, like you said, an annoying degree. She's irritatingly clever and gets this information out of him. Yeah. And it's it's like sweet foreshadowing, I think. Like yeah. it, it is. So it's like I, cool. I, I I really like like the scene, but um, yeah. you know, they do they sneak Ellie out and uh, out of the QZ using this old smuggling tunnel that they have at their disposal, um, which is funny because they just kind of came out of a pothole, which was actually like way more realistic <laughs> than coming from under a board in the game. I was like, this is true. Kind of yeah. cool. I come from like just loose asphalt, um, yeah. you know, before they can kind of cross into like the city ruins, they're spotted by a Federa soldier taking a piss who turns out to be freaking Lee. Of course. Who else? And yeah. You know, he, Lee looks like he had some fun with those pills at this point. He's got like, you know, like his face, <laughs> he's got like bags under his eyes and everything. Right. Um, but, you know, he's also like uninterested in being bought off by like by the smugglers at this time. Yeah. Which is is funny because he literally just sold ration tickets for some pills like that day. But it's funny. It's funny how like he's almost mad that like he they're putting him through this. Like, he, he he said like I told you to stay off the streets. Like he's mad at Joel for like making him arrest him almost. Like right. I, I tried to warn you, and now you're making me go by the book basically. Right. And I was like, it's not like have a body cam. Just let him go, dude. <laughs> Yeah, so, just let him go. Yeah, yeah, just let him go. Like I would have been like, just yeah, pretend I, you didn't turn around while you were taking a piss and didn't see anything. Right. <laughs> it's all good. And, and if they're gonna, and if they're gonna bargain, I feel like you should have probably maybe asked for more pills. Like I don't know. Like <laughs> just like I was like, is maybe this is could be lucrative for you? Like did not yeah, see really. the potential, and it in you know it bit him in the it's ass. Weird. So like maybe Lee maybe is, the hydros made him made him paranoid or something. <laughs> <laughs> they no, I can't let you go. I have to arrest you. <laughs> I can't. I don't crave any more hydros at this moment. No, but 
but like <laughs> you know like lee begins he just is like hey we're doing this by the books and so he has mm-hmm. everybody get on their knees and he scans mm-hmm. them and um you know like ellie is seems to be super terrified at the prospect of being uh scanned and so she stabs lee in the leg with her switchblade right as he mm-hmm. scans her and joel like goes into like full uh you know fight or flight mode his is fight uh and it's you can see that he has like ptsd from um you know the memories of the night that his daughter died yeah. uh and he you know he sees lee pointing his gun at this kid and you know the soldier in full garb pointing yeah. a gun at a child yeah. and and he just like fucking loses it and he beats lee um possibly unconscious possibly to death yeah it's it, yeah <laughs> he beat lee gets the the mess beat out of him like his yeah. joel's <laughs> hand is bleeding and lee is not moving yeah and if you're playing of the game Lee's probably dead. I Lee is not in the game, but I'm gonna guess right. Lee is probably dead after that. In the in the game, uh, Joel didn't leave a lot of uh, um, guys nursing bruises, uh, nursing bruises uh, behind him. Let's say that. Like, yes. <laughs> when he takes you out of the fight, he takes you out of the fight for life, pretty much. There is a quote so. from the game too that it says, or someone someone goes, "Damn, you hit hard," and he goes, "Yeah, because I was trying to kill you." <laughs> right <laughs> so. right yeah he doesn't pull his punches at all <laughs> no and so yeah so they are temporarily safe from uh this this op- this encounter with with fedra um but before they can move on before they can escape uh tess notices that lee's scanner has landed on the on the ground and she notices the uh positive result on the scanner meaning that ellie is infected so she immediately turns on Ellie, like, what the fuck is this? Like, yeah, you know, just kind of demand an explanation. Also, like, it, she's turning into, like, she's a, st- like, you can tell she's, like, seconds away from pulling her pistol and shooting Ellie in the head because that's what she's used to doing. Like, we can tell from context that Tess is uh, accustomed to when you find out someone's infected, you kill them before they can turn. It's kind of yeah. like the common, common knowledge of this, of this world that we all live in now. Um, but Ellie is, you know, yelling back like no i I'm, I'm clean like i'm not i'm not turning trust me and she actually shows a bite mark on her arm that uh she claims is nearly a week old and as we can as we know from earlier in this show and you know from what ellie's saying right now no one lasts more than a day after being if, after being infected everyone turns within 24 hours um so knowing that tess and joel are just kind of dumbfounded at ellie's apparent immunity like she's she seems to be immune but that doesn't make any sense that doesn't compute for them like that 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 can't be right so they don't have time to uh figure it out though because federal troops are closing in fast and they have nowhere to go but deeper into the ruins of boston where we get to see or hear a familiar clicking noise and we see something in the distance oh boy Dude, the, that closing shot right before credits roll of the, the skyscrapers in the background, like one just kind of collapsed into another one. Uh, it was so cool. That was such a strong ending. Uh, but yeah. that is that is the end of episode one. That's where it leaves us. And <sighs> Okay, so we have a lot of thoughts, uh, a lot of things to uh, discuss, but that is the breakdown of the first episode. So we're going to take a break here uh, and uh, hear from our sponsors again. But... Uh, Stick around, and we'll be back soon. Okay, we're back, and uh, yeah, man, we've 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 said this before uh, at the at the top that just this was such a satisfying first episode for in a lot of ways. I have a few thoughts. I'll just get out of the way. Um, overall, my impressions of this episode are just that they did such a great job with world building in general, like. Uh, it's 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 expert tier how they set the tone of the setting and uh just put you there uh visually you know with 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 the sound with the soundscapes with the art style with the performances um the thing about like and, and just the lore or the kind of the the background information of the of the of the world of the last of us you know if you've played the games you probably remember like oh just picking up documents and finding notes that sort of help you that, that illustrate the broader world for you, that kind of put you there. And initially, before I watched this episode, I, I had concerns that without, you know, those mechanics, like the 
the the little lore, the exposition bits. Without that to help exposit the world, I thought I was afraid the show would kind of struggle to make the world feel alive. But the flavor yeah. of the environments and how vibrant and lifelike this all the scenes were, everything drew me in so well. Like I was just hooked, and I bought in so easily. Maybe it's because I've played the games and I'm used to this setting, but like. I, I I I had a feeling that like even someone who knew nothing about The Last of Us could watch this and feel pretty pulled in. Yeah. Um, I in particular, I really loved how the Fedra occupation of the Boston QZ was so oppressive and so um, it, it was it was shown organically and naturally. It wasn't told to you; it was shown to you. Yeah. Um, so things like that really really helped set the set the mood and build the world around us yeah. as viewers. Uh- yeah, I will say because like two things that I noticed uh, in there that were like interesting to me was like the scene where like Joel is just like kind of waiting and and it, in that um, it was almost like a uh, town square or like an eating area, like an outdoor eating mm-hmm. area, but there was all those people just like hanging out. You know, you go from there, you see these people like seemingly sitting. It was like a like weird market type thing, and people are just sitting there with their friends talking at tables. Yeah, and then you're walking up the street and you're just seeing like, you know, Uber homelessness and, and everything. And then you're going to like a public execution and it's like, they're just like really showing you like everybody, you know, like, you know, not to be mean or poke fun. Everyone is dressed like they are in the matrix outside of the matrix. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like the rags basically like wearing whatever you can come up with. And yeah. And it's like, those are the happy people. And then it's like, then there's the the people that are just like, just totally homeless. Mm-hmm. And then there's like, you know, these people that are breaking the law, and but like they're being harshly prosecuted considering the state of this world. Yeah. Yeah, everything, everything felt just bleak enough and just like the, the exact right amount of like, just uh dreariness but yeah. it there was also a lot of life to it um yeah. that it didn't feel like unbelievable so everything felt so natural <clears throat> and real and uh, another stray thought i had was just that i was surprised by how much i really enjoyed anna torv's performance as tess anna torv is a is a great actress i've seen her in a few other things but she just melted into the role of tess like she nailed the personality really well it got this like kind of tough pragmatic worldwide like you know streetwise kind of um you know woman who's been around the block knows what she's doing and similarly i was also pleasantly su- surprised by uh bella ramsey as ellie like i knew she would do good I, I i had a good feeling about her from the get-go but like watching her her early scenes i was like it was better than i expected even and because like there's a, there's a bitterness to ellie that she really really embodied this sense of humor, this kind of like caustic, you know, standoffish attitude that, and all of it though, is hiding this inner core of like the, what she's been through and what she's scared of. And like she, Ellie is a mask in a lot of ways and yep. it's, it's hiding a lot of things. And Bella really understood that. And I, I think I noticed that even in the trailer, when we were talking about the trailer, I was like, I could tell from the, from the beginning that Bella Ramsey understood that aspect of Ellie. And it was really fun to watch early on. I, so I also think she didn't play the game until she um, did the show. Yeah, I, I heard about that. I think she was <laughs> she was she was told not to. But she, I think she said in some interview where like, she was like, "Yeah, I couldn't resist." Though I eventually played it. Like I think it was like after they'd filmed the show, yeah. so it was like didn't impact her performance, I guess. But you could have fooled me. Like it, yeah. it does seem like she played the game enough to uh, understand the character really, really well. So now but, she's. Uh, she kind of falls into the category we're talking about. So now she has to come on the show and talk to us. Absolutely. <laughs> Bella, we love you. Come on, uh, come on and talk to us. That'd be, that'd be awesome. Uh, and similarly, you know, on, in the same vein, I want to you know shout out to Merle Dandridge. Merle Dandridge is a powerhouse, man. I love her. And, you know, she has the distinction of being the only actor from the game to reprise their role in the show. Yeah. She was she was Marlene in mocap and you know performance capture for the for the game, and she's on screen now as Marlene, which is amazing, and I can see why because Merle yeah. Dandridge owns this character so hard. 
Oh, yeah. It made perfect sense for her to, you know, portray Marlene again on on live action. Like, she's she's so incredible. I, I love watching her. So. Oh yeah, I almost forgot that and, uh, like that she actually was the the you know actor from the game too. I was like, damn, this person mm-hmm. has this character down packed. And then I was like, oh yeah, you do have yeah. this character down packed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I didn't I didn't know it was actually Merle Dandridge at first too. I was like. I just was watching the show. I was like, wow, this, whoever they got from Arlene is like really good. And she really reminds me of Merle Dandridge. And I was like, oh, that is Merle Dandridge. Holy oh, yeah. shit. <laughs> so now, yeah, she, she nailed it for sure. Um, so lastly, I'll, I'll, you know, wrap up with this is that overall, you know, I don't think I could have asked for much, a much better opening to this, to this series. Like as a, as a premiere episode, I really feel like it captured basically everything I love about the beginning of the game while, expanding upon the characters and also building out the world even more. So like you're really only missing like the, the pushing of the buttons. Otherwise you're getting everything that I liked about the game. And there's, it's cool because like, it's, it's a basically a one-to-one translation of the story. Like all the beats are there, all the narrative beats are there, but there are some like gaps in the, in the story that the game sort of left a little, like, not, like, completely empty, but, like, they just didn't go out of their way to fill in those gaps in the game. But in the show, they're all just kind of just fleshed out expertly, like, uh, you know, giving us more to absorb. Uh, You know, for example, where Joel and Tommy were, what they were up to while Sarah was alone at the house that night, uh, we're getting all that context. We're getting everything, like, kind of... um, just not spelled out for us, but, like, we're, we're getting the full picture of, of what's happening. And, um, just the, the, the scene, the first scene with Tess and Robert also like that also fills in gaps that, you know, the the game court sort of left for us. So, um, it's, it's the full package basically. It's, um, it's a extremely faithful adaptation, but not, I would say there's, there is danger of being too faithful, you know, where you literally just copy paste the cutscenes into, uh, in front of a camera for a prestige TV production, but you have no imagination in terms of like doing something different or yeah. taking advantage of the format of television to, you know, take the story to the next level. That is the danger of an adaptation that is too faithful. But I think this episode at least walked that line perfectly, where it's like we're taking everything we can from the game, putting it exactly where it needs to be, and then just sort of plugging in little bits and pieces to flesh everything else out. So it, I, 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 I hesitate to use the word perfect, but fuck, man, it's it's pretty close. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, I mean, on, in that same vein, I almost feel like they like with a lot of the stuff that we got that filled in gaps might have been like writing that was for the game originally that, you know, just sure. didn't make sense to keep for timing and, and everything. And I feel like it's like you did have Neil Druckmann, you know, championing like, you know, he's like executive producing on this. And I feel like it was like, oh, yeah, you know, when we originally wrote this. This is why he left. But, you know, we didn't want to tell anybody that or like this is originally why this happened. But, you know, it was and that's what it it felt like. And that's what I I liked it so much. Like, you know, I echo your point. Like, I, I think this was was fantastic. Like the beginning of the story just, um you know, felt like um, the beginning. I mean, it was like you shot for shot from the game. And I loved that. I love that we got a little bit of extra like. um you know, background about what's going on. But then I liked when we were just like, oh, my God, I feel like I'm playing this game. But like, I'm, you know, I'm sitting here watching this show. Um, and it didn't tow that line of being like, you know, like a, a, a copy paste. It, it felt like it, it did have that like uh, kind of new feeling to it. Like the the plane crashing instead of them getting hit by a truck, I thought was way better because that made sense. Like, you know, it's like, hey, what if a plane tries to take off and they there's an infected person inside of it or the pilots infected? And like there's so much shit that could go wrong. Um, and I, I just like I just super duper appreciated how they they um, they handled it. And I even like how they pulled lines from the game like they had Sarah. Uh, when Joel was like, you know, how did you get the money to fix his watch? And she's like, I sell hard drugs. And like, I was sitting there, I was sitting there watching this with friends. And I was like, I was like mouthing that line. It's like, how did you get this? And I, I just was like, 
And then she said it at the same time, and I'm like, ah, it's from the game. And I had to, like, I felt like that Leonardo DiCaprio meme with the popcorn where he's just, like, pointing the whole time because, like, it was just like, yeah. ah, this is this and this and that. No. Nah. Yep. So, like, yep. really good because, like, to me, as someone who's played this game a billion times, like, it's it felt new. And so, like, yeah. I, I was like, oh, this is this is fantastic. But it was like it felt new because it was still the same stuff that I knew was going to happen that I really loved that made this game it, the game it is. But it was also like that little bit of extra context. So like that's why I'm super curious to see what people who didn't you know play the game thought about it. But like also like I mentioned earlier, you know, if you've listened to this, this, uh, you know, if you've listened to any of the Last of Us episodes before uh, before we started covering the series, like had Leo and myself in there, we made way too many jokes about Jimmy Cooper. And I loved that they still like had an homage to Jimmy Cooper. So I feel like there's something in the show, um, you know, for like the deep, deep fandom where it's it's like, oh, hey, instead of your neighbor, your neighbors are, you know, the Adsons or whatever. But like the um, the farm is the Cooper's farm. I'm like, OK, cool. Nice, nice little head nod for for us, because I think Jimmy Cooper has like a Wikipedia page, which is how we found out about it in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> um, Hell yeah. And then it's just like. um I will say like the things I like that are a little bit different where like the stakes are changed, like yeah. the stakes for the quest uh, needed to be changed because in the video game, it was still like, you know, hey, we got duped by Robert, but like we got duped by Robert over some guns mm -hmm. um, and like that, that kind of um, that reasoning for the quest in the game kind of fizzles out immediately. You know, like it's like, oh, we'll get guns and then never hear about those guns ever again. And so, right. <laughs> yeah, it's like like, like right. it's just like so like having this is a um, I think like this is an appropriate change for. Um, I, I agree. It, it, it makes more sense this way. I think making it that making it so that Joel has this uh, this outside motivation that isn't just like. It, it's more overarching. It's more like I, I'm gonna go find my brother. Like it's overarching. Uh, it makes it feels way better that way. I agree. Yeah. So it's it's like I I I definitely like I just appreciate them doing this a lot more. Um, and I think it'll like I want to see how it impacts the, some of the story going forward. Um, and then I like how they did like small things like Joel's a combat veteran. They had it on the back of his his truck, you know, like he served. And so like that was something, you know, like because in the game, it was always like, you know, maybe that 20 year gap shit happened. And it just kind of right. made him this like battle hardened badass. But I was like, you know, it's actually kind of cool to see like, nah, he was served in the military in the beginning. And like, that's probably where that came from. And it was just kind of like uh, like this 20 year gap gave him some allowed him to practice said skills um right but like yeah I, like i think like this was a just overall it was a good show like you know it's good when even when the internet trolls aren't bashing the show the internet trolls <laughs> are like sarcastically bashing the show about small things like i saw someone that was like this game is a or this show is a poor adaptation because like you didn't um get through the first part and die 18 million times and then give up on the game. <laughs> <laughs> and so right. it's, it's like, it's, so it's not real. Like they're like, Joel didn't die a hundred million times and then finally move ahead. And then like, someone's like, Oh, the farm is to the left. This is the worst adaptation I've ever it's, seen. It's in on my the life. wrong side of the road. <laughs> <He> <laughs> fucked it up. <laughs> so it's like, like, you know, it's yeah. like people are loving it when you're like the people that are trolling you are just like, ah, this detail is like yeah. stupid. I'm, but I'm just fucking joking. And you know, the final thing I like about it is like, this was the darkest timeline in the world for George Bush. Like George, <laughs> <laughs> ultimate, ultimate, like Ugh. just absolutely super shitty George Bush timeline. Like, yeah, man, George Bush America, happens and then cordyceps happens. <laughs> <laughs> like I had a meme of like them where they're like talking to him when he's in the classroom and it's like cordyceps can now infect humans. And I'm just like, it's just like it's <laughs> it's so it's so bad, but it's it's just generally like, yeah. 
damn, George Bush is like, God damn, my presidency. <laughs> this is like, why did I Good do Good thing this? I did that Patriot Act now, huh? <laughs> right. right. The W is not standing for winner <laughs> when all this Jesus shit is Christ. happening. <laughs> oh, man. But yeah, those oh. are, those are, that's, those are my thoughts. Wow. Yeah, no, it's. I, I think to your point of like the things that they change for the better, I, I, I will come back to the very beginning. The first the first scene w- with the scientists at the in the on that TV show, that was not in the game. There was nothing like that in the game originally. But I thought that was a really cool way to uh, tease the main concept and kind of like it was it was a little thing. It was just a little something to nibble on that was kind of thought provoking and just a fun performance to watch, too. And just it was kind of like a. Uh, yeah, it's, I guess, like, um, in the game, when there's that transition and kind of like the opening credits right after Sarah dies, and it's like right before the time skip 20 years, you're getting, like, little snippets of conversation, like radio broadcasts, like you're hearing about, like, you know, federal law being, or, mar- sorry, martial law being declared, and the Fireflies kind of announcing their intentions to overthrow FEDRA and, like, reinstate the civilian government, basically. Right. And... Like you're getting that in that part of the game, but I think in the show it makes sense to like sort of tease the the threat from a scientific detached angle at the beginning and then sort of introduce it slowly in the first few scenes. I thought it's just good decisions all around with stuff yeah. like that. But there's also on the on the flip side stuff that's like taken directly from the game, like you said, some of the some of the dialogue, like the, the hardcore drugs thing. Uh, later on, when they're in Joel's apartment, just killing time until nightfall before they can escape the QZ, uh, Ellie asks, "What am I supposed to do now? Or what am I supposed to do to pass the time?" And Joel's like, "I'm sure you will figure that out exactly from the game." So it's like stuff that like feels like if it fits in the show, use it. If it doesn't, use something else or invent something that f- makes some more sense. So, yeah, like it, it's like I said, just excellent decisions for what to keep, what to substitute, what to add um, in general. So, yeah, amazing, amazing stuff. Really solid first episode. Uh, really excited to see what where the rest of the series takes us. So definitely. And um, in 2023 sorry, and 2000, like I just like that <laughs> they, they made it. So it's in 2023. I was like, this is fantastic. Yeah, first- that was pretty interesting. You got. I was like, good change, because you first you hit us with the global warming, then you have a COVID reference, then you're like, it's happening right fucking now. And you're just like, all right, I'm I'm yeah. I'm listening now. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm paying attention. That's wild. <laughs> yeah, that's wild. So uh, one another thing, we'll, we'll, we we want to talk really quickly about some uh, memorable quotes, maybe dialogue, things we heard in the show that uh, stuck with us, and you know, I'll just. It's, Actually, it's funny. I didn't actually latch on to a ton of the dialogue. And not I was because I was I, as a as a fan of the game. I'm kind of like looking so much at like the environments and you know the 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 action, the uh, scene to scene kind of flow. I, I I guess I wasn't listening too hard for the dialogue, but some things that did stick out to me was uh, how you know you saw graffiti from the fireflies everywhere, uh, particularly in uh you know the boston quarantine zone you see their kind of rallying cry their slogan which is if you're lost in the dark or if you're lost in the darkness look for the light and at at one point where joel and tess are looking for robert some guy approaches joel and uh just starts trying to make conversation with him and uh he like is about to say you know if you're lost in the dark and joel cuts him off and says if you say look for the light i'll break your jaw and the guy <laughs> just kind of like shuts up and walks away and it, it was just this really cool moment uh that isn't something from the game but feels like it could have been yeah and really fits this you know it, it also kind of uh alludes to and refers to uh joel's feelings on the fireflies maybe you know this falling out that he had with his brother that might have had to do with the fireflies and just his surly attitude in general just you can leave me the fuck alone and i, I you just I, I, I coming back to the uh, ambush earlier where the fireflies and fedra are fighting and kind of tess gets caught in the middle of it you know the firefly yells free boston now motherfuckers and i i, I that stuck out to me as an interesting way to you know, because it wasn't spelled out in exposition or in really specific dialogue what the Fireflies were, like what they wanted. Right. Uh, except later on, Marlene kind of spelled it out. She says, we are opposing a military dictatorship, basically. But their introduction on screen was 
these guys in like insurgency looking clothing and kind of like using insurgent tactics like ambushing from above and yelling free Boston now. Uh, that's kind of like, oh, OK, so they are enemies of the soldiers. They are enemies of the martial law that runs this place. So it was a really good example of show don't tell, I think. So right. that was stuff like that kind of stuck out to me. Yeah, no, it's a hundred percent. Excuse me. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. Um, I think, um, yeah, there wasn't, there weren't a lot of, I agree. There wasn't a lot of, weren't a lot of quotes that stuck with me. Cause it was like a lot of stuff from the video games. And so I was like, Oh, I will yeah. avoid my, my video game chatter as much as possible. But like, I do think that, uh, one thing the quote stuck out to me was just like, you know, the infected, you know, isn't even the worst thing out there. You know, there are hunters and slavers and like, I was like, okay, that's a. That was like, I was like, that's interesting that they are hunters and slavers because like, slavers is a is a you don't see that in the first game, but <laughs> but I'm just like right, yeah. I was like, I was like, that's I was like, that's a, like a nice little like a uh, you know little sprinkle in there about like the Last of Us Part Two, but like yeah. the point is that. Um, you know, it, it, what I really liked about that quote is it, it is, uh, enough to show you how fucked up the world is. Cause it's been 20 years and, uh, there are, we just went through this, you know, chaotic event where we saw an old woman eating two people and like, yeah. and, and like, we saw this thing, you know, like this, this just mass chaos and, uh, civil unrest and, you know, we have some safe haven inside of this quarantine zone and people are like, you know, people are obviously like being hung for trying to leave, but they're also being hung for trying to sneak in. So like, this is a point of, um, you know, these are, this is like a a hub of safety, but you have to, you surrender a lot. So Mm -hmm. when this, you know, when this is the world that you live in and these are the things that are, you know, causing you to live it, live like this if that's not the worst thing Mm -hmm. out there then like that just goes to show the state of society and it is that bad like it's it's even worse right but like that's it's just like i i love that little line because i was like it's so powerful like because there's a lot Mm -hmm. you can infer from it even if you've never played the video games because it's like yeah you know you go out there and fight a like at least when you fight infected you kind of know what to expect because so much time has passed but like so much time has passed with people also and people are the unpredictable things the mushroom is just gonna take control of your body fling you at stuff and probably have you bite people yeah (laughs) it it does what it does you can sort of you you can expect it to follow a pattern of behavior but people you you never know what to expect from people because look at Federa, they're enslaving people for no reason like you know they're they're a dictatorship for no reason like what are you in command of when like this is society like what are you your control of like people in poverty and rations like there's like no sort of uh like what what is there to gain but it's like people have this like just like unpredictable need to like you know or or just like this this like drive to be over top of other people and so like Mm -hmm. you've got this um military occupation for no reason when like these they could be helping uh these civilians like survive and rebuild and expand yeah it's kind it's that's an interesting question like we i'm sure we'll get into this again later like if we you know when the the, the topic of Fedra will come up again, I'm sure, and it is this interesting question of could Fedra be helping people rebuild society instead of what it seems to be doing? What it seems like they're doing is just clinging to a status quo yeah. that, you know, it's kind of like their standing orders that they received before the government completely collapsed was keep people in the quarantine zones, keep, maintain order, distribute the the rice and lentils and shit so people can stay alive and just, you know, keep the, you know, keep the cogs moving, but they're not like, you know, setting up sustainable farms or, you know, like reclaiming the wilderness. They're not like, they're not being pro proactive in re reestablishing society. They're just kind of Cooking fighting. They're, yeah. Burning the bodies ma- and maintaining control over what's left instead of, you know, so that is an interesting question. And, uh, yeah, it's it's like uh, it, yeah, it's like if if it's bad in here, 
even worse out there than what are we fucking doing, man? It, it comes back to that uh, quote from the trailer, like, is there hope or is there not? If not, why keep going? Stuff like that. It's those are the themes that I'm sure we'll be exploring more in the in, the, in this season. So uh, I guess we'll, I get, lastly, before we uh, wrap up uh, this episode, is uh, we'll be getting into some questions. You know, things we have after after watching this first episode. You know, things we're curious about, and uh, hoping you know. And uh, I guess one thing I'm curious about is if we'll be seeing cutaways or maybe a B plot focusing on Marlene kind of leading the few remaining fireflies to Salt Lake city or wherever they end up in this continuity. Cause in the game, that's where they go. Sorry. Spoiler alert, but uh, I'm just, you know, I'm, oh, no. I'm not expecting to, uh, <laughs> I'm not, ex- I'm not expecting the show. I'm not expecting the show to focus on that uh, as a cutaway or whatever, but, I could be wrong because there were things that I wasn't expecting in this first episode that we got anyway. So um, the way that this first episode was plotted, it's kind of making me wonder. Um, one other thing I thought was cool was that early in the episode uh, at the at the QZ, there's a poster that can be seen on a wall that kind of details the cordyceps inspe- infection, and it says that it, it, we can we can glean from this that infection sets in faster or slower in human victims depending on where they're bitten. Now, this is a bit of a departure from the game. I don't think this was in the game. Uh, if you're bitten on the face or your neck or your head, you're, you're, you're turning within minutes. But if it's on your arm or on your torso, it'll take like a couple hours. And if it's on your feet or your legs, uh, it's, it can take up to a day, about 24 hours. And so it's a nice bit of world building that I liked seeing. And it's, yeah, like I said, it's kind of a difference from the, from the game because in the game, didn't really seem like it mattered where you were bitten. It, yeah, it did. usually took a like a day or two. It's it's kind of the the timeline we saw in the game. So I'm just wondering if that detail, the detail about you know location being important, I'm wondering if that'll be relevant again later. That's just something I was curious about. Yeah, and and, uh, and it was never it, it was like never actually said. So like it could be yeah. a, a true thing from the thing in the game. They were always just like yeah, you know, people turn within yada yada yada. So like right, yeah. I think in the game when when Ellie reveals her bite to Tess and Joel, I think I remember Tess saying like explicitly, everyone turns within two days. That's yeah. kind of like what the timeline of the game is. Like, like that that's kind of like what she's. That's why they're so dumbfounded. Like no, that can't be right. That that looks like it's a week old, but no one turn no one lasts more than two days. So uh, yeah, that's interesting. I just you know if you know the whole location thing mattering might be might be might come up again later, um, and. Lastly, one other thing I'm curious about is if we're going to get any flashbacks or vignettes to showing us the intervening 20 years between 2023 and 20, 2003, where, uh, you know, I'd be interested in seeing maybe Joel and Tommy, you know, flashbacks of them surviving together, maybe eventually kind of having their falling out and they're splitting up over differing opinions on the Fireflies. I I I only ask because I really hope we see that. That'd be really cool. I would I would look forward to that. But. Yeah, because that and the Marlene stuff and the game, because like the mm-hmm. game for Marlene, uh, I would like to see what happens because they only give you like little notes mm-hmm. and recordings, yeah. and it's like seems like some shit went down. And then same thing with Joel. I mean, they don't give you notes and recordings. Like they literally just give you one liners. Uh, where like Joel just says something and you're like, oh, that's like interesting because you've just like you've given a lot, you know, you've given a lot by saying a little about a, a specific situation. So it would be right. interesting because like there's there's a lot there. There's like a, there's there are some things that, you know, from playing the game, if you're just like paying attention to dialogue uh, that kind of tell you a little bit about what Joel did in the, those times. Uh, but like there's never anybody like we did this or this or this or this or why we did any of this. It's just a single line. And Joel is like, doesn't fucking talk about anything because obviously yeah. it's like crazy. Yeah. And it's, it's just, it's, it's just buried down and he's not the type of person that's like vulnerable. He is a very like, like hardened, closed off person, especially at this right. point. So right. that'd be interesting. Yeah. And then yeah, like, we get those references to we did what we had to do to survive. And uh, I would love to see in detail, like what Tommy and Joel had to go through yeah. for that context. That'd be cool. Yeah. 
I a hundred percent. Um, yeah. the only question I really had, I been couldn't, couldn't think of anything was just basically like, yeah, I wonder what kind of relate we, we talked about this earlier, but like what kind of relationship Joel and Tess have in here? Because like, I always thought like, yeah, it was like, like, cause they're, they're both so like hardened that it, it in the game, it kind of sways, uh, between like platonic friends and business partners since like you know there's not a lot of people out there you can trust so like you know i found somebody i can trust um and then it's like also at points it it, it you're like eh, i could see it but like this one it was like oh you guys are like sharing a bed because i didn't even realize they lived together i like in, yeah. in the game i thought like she just kind of came over at the beginning of the game right so uh, and so like yeah that's i was like oh okay cool and and like so like I, that in, that relationship is interesting because like neither of them are are vulnerable people that talk about anything like so yeah I'm I'm, I'm curious and I want to see like maybe they'll explore that a little bit in this uh, in this um, show and you know maybe while we're, while we're you know yeah so I'm I'm hoping that they'll maybe they'll explain that a little bit further because like that that's interesting um, and uh, I think honestly, like that is my only question. Everything else, I thought I was like, "Oh, this is freaking great." Yeah, absolutely. We, uh, I mean, this this was obviously a strong starting point. It sets a high water mark for the series, like you know, strong start. So uh, we'll see where it goes from here. But uh, you know, it's high expectations on my end, at least. So. Oh yeah. Same. Yeah. Loved it. Well, that about wraps it up. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please take a second to rate and review us on Apple Podcast and Spotify because it really helps us grow the show. And be sure to connect with us on Twitch, Instagram, and Twitter at lore underscore party. Thanks for listening. Don't get infected. And we'll catch you next time. <laughs> take care. Stay off the hydros. <laughs>